Hi, everyone. In John 13, 13. Got a video. I'm sorry. Love one another as I have loved you. So you must love one another. On April 7th, we'll be starting a seven session Bible study on the five love languages between services. The five love languages help you understand your own love language and the love language of others, whether it is your spouse, kids, family, friends, or coworkers. These sessions will give you a perspective on how others feel loved. They include videos, a workbook, and discussion. Although the workbook is geared toward married couples, all are welcome. Want a taste of what this is all about? Take the five love language quiz. It'll take about five minutes. Please contact the church office to sign up. I look forward to seeing you on April 7th. Now here's a short video of one of the love languages. It's my turn. <laughs> God's grace and peace to you as we gather for worship at the Sun Prairie United Methodist Church on this Palm Sunday. My name is Jenny Arneson, and I serve as the lead pastor here at the church. We welcome those that are gathered here in the sanctuary and those that are joining us online today. And as a reconciling congregation, we believe that we extend a wide welcome to all people because that is what Jesus did. And when we extend that wide welcome, we are worshiping together, we are joining and growing in our faith, we're serving others in our community and serving God in the things that we do. So we hope that you'll find this time of worship to be encouraging and life-giving on your journey of life and faith and hope that you feel welcome here today. Well, your attendance is important to us. When you came in, you received an attendance card, and we hope you'll fill that out, and then you can drop that in the offering plate as we leave worship today. And for those that are visiting this morning, we are glad that you are here and welcome you and hope that you'll introduce yourself after worship and also stop by our Welcome Center, which is just outside the sanctuary doors in the narthex. And if you are joining us as a guest online today, we hope you'll go over to our church website at sunprairieumc.org and be able to see the ministries that we share together and how we serve God in our communities together. Well, now we do begin our worship by pouring water into our baptismal font. And on this Palm Sunday, as we pour out the water of baptism, we are reminded that it is our baptism that initially calls us into the body of Christ. And scripture affirms that we are one body in one spirit, and that we are one spirit in God through baptism. There's one God, one faith, one baptism. May we remember our baptism and be thankful. And now in that spirit of love and welcome to all people, our chancel choir will bring us into our Palm Sunday worship. <clears throat> Yeah. 
Good morning. My name is Brenda Carlson Hahn. Please join me in our call to worship. May we sense the presence of God here in this place. A sudden lifting of the heart or a child's ready smile. A song that comes quickly to our lips. A feeling of acceptance and hints of hope. A tale of welcome that invites all to gather. That moves among us, calling us to gather and worship. And God is on this Lenten journey with us so that our lives may be songs of praise and shouts of Hosanna. Our first scripture reading is Psalm 31, verses 9 through 16. Have mercy on me, God, because I am depressed. My vision fails because of my grief, as do my spirit and body. My life is consumed with sadness. My years are consumed with groaning. Strength fails me because of my suffering, and my bones dry up. I'm a joke to all my enemies, still worse to my neighbors. I scare my friends, and whoever sees me in the streets runs away. I am forgotten like I am dead, completely out of mind. I am like a piece of pottery, destroyed. Yes, I've heard all the gossiping terror all around. So many gang up against me. They plan to take my life. But me, I trust you, Lord. I affirm you are my God. My future is in your hands. Don't hand me over to my enemies, to all who are out to get me. Shine your face on your servant and save me by your faithful love. A word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. children that would like to come up for our children's time, you can come on up for our time together.
Come on up. All right, we have our basket. If you have an offering, you can put it in there. I'm just going to make, make room for me here. All right. If you have an offering, you put it in the basket. You, want, you could put it in later. You could put it in later. That's fine. We won't forget your money. Yeah. <laughs> oh. Well, good morning, everyone. Did you like waving your palms in the palm parade? Yeah. Yeah. You were very enthusiastic. I was looking at some of the other people. They weren't as enthusiastic as you. <laughs> yeah, were you enthusiastic? Did, did you like it? You saw your grandma? I have a perfect one. I know. It's just perfect, isn't it? Aren't they all, I think they're all pretty perfect. Yeah, it's perfect. Oh. Well, today is Palm Sunday, isn't it? Yeah, so it's a day that we wave our palms and we have a little bit of a parade. And I wonder if that was maybe a little bit like it was when Jesus came into Jerusalem on the day that we call Palm Sunday and people were waving branches and they put their coats on the ground to welcome him. I wonder if it was a little bit like what we did today with waving our palm branches. I know, it was just kind of a way of welcoming him, putting their coats on the ground. So they welcomed him into Jerusalem. And then this week, this week will be called what we call Holy Week. And we'll remember the last days of Jesus' life on earth. And so we're going to be reading different scriptures during the week that talk about Jesus' life. And on Thursday, we'll remember Jesus eating his last supper with his friends, with his disciples. And they were at a table eating dinner. And Jesus told them a new commandment. He said, I, I want to tell you something new about loving each other. And we're still trying to learn that commandment, aren't we? Of how we love all people. So Jesus gave his friends, his disciples, that commandment on Thursday. And then on Friday, Jesus, Jesus died on Friday. And then after three days, then next Sunday is Easter. And what happened? He came back, right, he came back to life, so the resurrection, so we'll celebrate next Sunday. But we, so we have, we have some things to do this week to get ready for Easter. But I have something special to show you today with your palm branches, of something you can do. You can fold one of your leaves of your palm branch into a cross, and I wanted to show you how to do this. So I brought some equipment here, so I need to have some scissors equipment yeah so I brought my scissors here so I'm gonna cut this palm leaf and I'm gonna cut it in half now what you got to watch close here okay you got to watch close and then when we're all finished I'm gonna give you instructions on a piece of paper of how to do this at home you know how to do it okay okay now it's, it's seven easy steps okay <laughs> all right <laughs> so so now just, just watch, watch really really close okay so you're going to fold it up like that, and then you're going to fold it down like this, and then you're going to fold it up like this. Now, I'm feeling a little bit of pressure today to do this because I haven't done it in front of people. Now, I folded, I folded some for all of you, too, and I folded them while I was watching the Badger game the other night. <laughs> and I thought that that was a good thing for me to do was fold crosses so I wouldn't get so frustrated <laughs> with our badgers. So, okay, and then that's, that's, that's four. Now I've slipped this one through here. Let's see if I can do this. Slip that right through. Oh, I have to just, sometimes you have to work with it a little bit. So I'm just going to cut it off a little right there. Okay, then I'm going to work this through here. Now just wait for it. Wait for it. It's almost done. If I can get this to go through. Yes, I did. Okay. Okay, and then, now watch, 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 watch. I turn it over, and then I go back through like this. This is the last tricky part. There we go, there we go. And then, voila! What is it? A cross. A cross! So I turn the palm leaf into a cross. So, so what you, well, you don't have to know how to do it right now because I'm going to give you instructions. And then I would suggest that you do this. It, like I, it does kind of look like an X, but you have to kind of, okay, now kind of use your imagination, okay? 
Okay. So <laughs> they're all not perfect, perfect, but it is, it, is, it is a cross if you look at it real close, okay? So I'm going to give you instructions how to do this, and you can do this with your grown-up, and you'll be able to do this with all your... So you could make all of these into little crosses if you wanted to. Wouldn't that be exciting? Yeah. And then I invite you... Yeah, I invite you to put this cross. I'm going to give you one of these, and you can put this somewhere this week where you'll be able to see it and remember Jesus' life and then his death and then next Sunday we'll really be able to celebrate when Jesus is resurrected and comes back to life. Okay? So, I'm going to have, after we say our prayer, I'm going to have Pastor Claire hand, help me hand these out. But I made all of these for each of us. And so you, yeah, so I, I, I did this whole basket full all during the Badger game. <laughs> well, I did, some, I did some yesterday, too. But, okay. All right, why don't we have our prayer together, and we'll lead the congregation in our Lord's Prayer, and then we'll give you a cross, okay? Let's pray. Dear God, thank you for being with us in this day of worship on this Palm Sunday. And now in this holy week, help us to remember your life. Help us to remember the love that you have told us to share with one another, so that on Sunday next week on Easter, we can truly celebrate. Thank you for our children. Thank you for their excitement of parading around our sanctuary with their palms this morning. And now we would ask that you continue to be with us in worship. We pray all of this in the name of Jesus, who taught us to pray together, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Okay, Pastor Claire, will you help me hand some of these out? All right, all right. And if you are second grade or under, you can go with Pastor Claire and go to church. To go to children's church. Well, you can go to children's church then. Yeah. yeah, okay. Thanks for coming up today. All right, here's, here's one for you. There you go.
Pastor Brad Mother and I'm the uh, director of our caring ministries here and so hello to those who are gathered uh, those who are uh, watching on live stream and hello choir you guys were you were great I can't kind of see you through the palms there but there you are um, you know um, I thought I had taken all the courses that I needed in seminary but but there was one course apparently I didn't quite get through I didn't know I needed an engineering degree in order to be able to, that was pretty amazing.
Our story today is uh, Luke's version of Palm Sunday, and I invite you to listen for the word of God. After Jesus said this, he continued on ahead going up to Jerusalem. As Jesus came to Bethpage and Bethany on the Mount of Olives, he gave two disciples a task. He said, go into the village over there. When you enter it, you'll find tied up a colt that no one has ever ridden. Untie it and bring it here. If anyone asks, why are you untying it? Just say, its master needs it. Those who had been sent found it exactly as he said. As they were untying the colt, its owner said to them, why are you untying the colt? They replied, its master needs it. They brought it to Jesus threw their coats on the colt and lifted Jesus onto it. As Jesus rode along, they spread their coats on the road. As Jesus approached the road leading down from the Mount of Olives, the whole throng of his disciples began rejoicing. They praised God with a loud voice because of all the mighty things they had seen. Jesus said, Blessings on the king who comes in the name of the Lord. Peace in heaven and glory in the highest heavens. Some of the Pharisees from the crowd said to Jesus, Teacher, scold your disciples. Tell them to stop. He answered them, I tell you, if they were silent, the stones would shout. As Jesus came to the city and observed it, he, he wept over it. He said, If only you knew on this day of all days, the things that lead to peace. But now they are hidden from your eyes. The time will come when your enemies will build fortifications around you and circle you and attack you from all sides. They will crush you completely, you and the people within you. They won't leave one stone on top of another within you because you didn't recognize the time of your gracious visit from God. Word of God from the people of God. Thanks be to God. Let us pray. Lord, on this Palm Sunday, we ask that you'd gather us now and uh, help us prepare our minds and hearts that we might receive your word. Amen. If you were to take a survey of faithful church-going folks, I think it's fair to say that everyone would know that today is Palm Sunday, right? Next Sunday is Easter, therefore this is Palm Sunday. But did you know that this day also has another name? Yeah, it's also sometimes called Passion Sunday, which begs the question, why are there two different names for this Sunday? Well, the answer is that the, that the story, today's story, Jesus' entry into Jerusalem, actually has two distinctly different moods. One is represented in the Festival of the Palms, as it's called, and we just experienced it, that wonderful chaos of kids and palm branches waving. While the other mood is the polar opposite. It's a mood that's somber, and pensive and dark. And it's the mood reflected in the tragedy and the horror that will take place later this week. Even as Jesus prays into the city to the shouts of the crowd, already some are muttering in the crowd, crucify him, crucify him, crucify him. Now, if the truth be told, most of us, including yours truly, would choose the festive side of today every time. After all, we've arrived at that time of the year when we're ready to be done with all the gloom and doom of winter, including surprise snowstorms, right? We're ready to get beyond that. We're ready for the joy of spring and the joy of Easter. But if we have to suffer through Monday, Thursday, and Good Friday, the anguish of it, so be it. 
but today we're glad to sing Hosanna and wave our palm branches. Now, before you start worrying that I'm about to do a pastor thing and take you down that other road, the road of gloom and doom, fear not, that's, that's not where I'm headed today. Instead, I'm, I'm hoping what will happen is that you'll explore with me the ambiguities of life, the yin and yang, the, the contradictions that we find in life that has us living with one foot in one world and another foot in another world. Because if you haven't noticed, there's something inside of us that doesn't like shades of gray. We don't like that, do we? We only like things really, if we're honest, when it's absolutely clear to us. We want clarity, not conflict. When we think of the Victorian age, we think of a time when everyone was prim and proper. My grandparents were uh, born in the uh, end of the Victorian age. And I have a picture of my brother and me when we were just little tunas in our bathing suits sitting on the beach in the Connecticut shoreline, sitting next to our grandfather who was wearing, are you ready for this? A white shirt and tie. The Victorian age was an age when everything was supposed to be prim and proper. But it was also an age that did everything to eliminate anything that bordered on ambiguity. For example, believe it or not, the Victorian age had a serious problem with Mr. Shakespeare. Why? Well, because they didn't like that deep, dark conflict that you find in his tragedies. So how did they deal with it? Well, it's simple. They just changed the ending. And so back then, the ending of of Romeo and Juliet was completely different. The young couple doesn't kill themselves, and the two families magically get along, and everyone, including Romeo and Juliet, lives happily ever after. That's how far the Victorians went to avoid the, the conflicts and the contradictions of life. But like it or not, that's not what we find when it comes to the events of Holy Week. Holy Week. Take, for example, Jesus' triumphal entry into Jerusalem. Luke tells us that he rides in the city on the back of a donkey like the victorious kings used to do after a great victory. Yet, this triumphal entry seals the deal. It seals his fate. Remember what the uh, Pharisees say to him as he's coming into the city? They say, quiet your disciples. Tell them to stop. And how does Jesus answer? He says, if they keep quiet, the stones themselves will cry out. Later, when Jesus is arrested, Peter too is overwhelmed with conflicting feelings. You know that story. Earlier in the evening, when they had shared a meal together, Peter had said, I'm going to stand by you, Lord, no matter what. He vows to do that. But when push comes to shove, later when he's in the courtyard of the high priest, what does he do? Three times he denies knowing Jesus at all. Even Peter the Rock, even Peter the Rock isn't able to escape a flood of conflicting emotions. But that, but Without question, the best example of conflicting feelings that we see during Holy Week is found in Jesus himself. You know where I'm headed here? Remember what happens in the Garden of Eden? Just before the guards come and arrest Jesus, he falls to his knees and he prays the most heartfelt prayer ever offered. He says, Lord, take this cup from me and then yet he says not my will Lord but yours can, can you imagine the, the, 
the conflicting emotions that were pulsating through him in that moment. Now, I know I'm hammering home something that you don't need me to remind you about. We all know what it's like to live with conflicting emotions and conflicts and ambiguities in life. We love our families, right? But they drive us crazy, right? We love the rewards of work, but it drives us crazy on a daily basis. We love to travel, but we hate to fly. We don't like those airports. We live with a steady diet of conflicting emotions and ambiguity. So what's the point? Well, here it is in a nutshell. Just as it's natural for us to struggle with mixed emotions and ambiguities in life, the same is true when it comes to our faith. We wish it was different. We long for that clarity when it comes to our faith. We don't want any shades of gray. And yet, as the events of today and the rest of the week remind us, that's simply not how human nature works. The fact is that some days our faith is as strong and as solid as the rock of Gibraltar, and other days it's like trying to grab a beam of light. We just can't get our hands around it. Now, if that concerns you, let me tell you the story about two of our greatest Christian leaders. They're, both of them are up on the route, route, uh, Mount Rushmore of Christian leaders, okay? Their names are absolutely familiar to you. One is Martin Luther, and the other is John Wesley. Now, in Luther's case, when he nailed those 95 theses or complaints up on the door of his church in Wittenberg, Germany, it would be a spark that would literally change the course of history. Literally change it. Uh, it was the beginning of the Reformation and the birth of the Protestant church. When brought before a court to answer for his beliefs, Luther declared with unvarnished faith, you'll remember this, here I stand. I can do no other, so help me God. Amen. Amen. And yet, despite this public stance, Luther struggled all of his life in all different kinds of ways. But in particular, he continued to struggle with his faith. He worried that his faith wasn't strong enough. Luther was a deeply tormented man. In much the same way, Wesley struggled with his faith as well despite starting a movement that would eventually sweep across the world. In Wesley's case, matters came to a head when he came home a broken man from the new colony in Savannah, Georgia. He had gone there as the pastor, as the missionary, as the, as the colony was being established by George Oglethorpe. What was the problem? Well, the colonists didn't like him. They hated him. They found him much too strict and, and too unforgiving. And Wesley also went there hoping to be able to convert the Native American neighbors. But they wanted nothing to do with Anglos and they wanted nothing to do with, with Wesley. And so he came home with his faith in shambles. And then shortly after he had returned to England, he had a, an experience, a faith-affirming experience. Again, you probably know the story. At a Bible study, he reported one night that his heart felt strangely warmed. He said, I felt I did trust in Christ, Christ alone for salvation. And assurance was given me that he had taken away my sins, even mine, and saved me from the law of sin and death. But when we read Wesley's journals, and he kept, he kept copious journals all through the rest of his life, over 50 years, what we find is that Wesley continued to struggle with his faith. 
Imagine, Luther and Wesley struggled with their faith. Now, I know this will probably uh, earmark me as a heretic, but if the truth be told, I'd be just fine if Lent was five days instead of, excuse me, six days <laughs> instead of six weeks. Okay? I'd be fine with that. In fact, I'd be fine if, if Lent was just six hours. You see, I, I'm an optimistic guy, and I can't wait for Easter. I'm like a kid waiting for Christmas. Seems like Easter will never come, particularly in the midst of the gloom and doom of winter. And so that means if given a choice, I'd opt for the palm branches instead of the passion every time. But the two moods of today remind us that as much as we wish we could have absolutely, absolute clarity when it comes to our faith, that is simply not the way it works. Like it or not, ambiguity is a part of life and it's a part of our faith as well. Two names, two different moods. That's what today is all about. Amen and amen.
now is our time to come together as a faith community in prayer. And we always remind you as we come to prayer that you can make a prayer request by going to our church website. There's a prayer request button there. Or you can reach out to the church office and we'll make sure we lift your prayers in worship and send them out over our prayer chain. I do have some prayers to lift to you today. Asking for our continued prayers for Pam Gerard. She has still been in the hospital this week, uh, but tomorrow it sounds like she's going to be going to a rehab facility to get stronger and then hopefully get back home again. But our continued par- prayers for Pam. And then our continued prayers for Butch Eschler. Uh, again, he recently had an extensive back surgery and has been in the hospital and is looking to get home and do his rehab at home. So our prayers for continued prayers for Butch. And thank you for your prayers for Joan Wink. Joan is the mother of Bo Wink and the mother-in-law of Lisa Wink, and she's been recently diagnosed with Parkinson's disease. So our, our prayers for Joan. Lori Couliard asked for our prayers for her extended family in Arkansas, uh, the death of her cousin Tom following a car accident. So our prayers for Lori's extended family. And then a joy to lift to you today, uh, Tierra Smith and her partner Trey have welcomed a new baby into the world. A long journey of labor, but finally Omari arrived, and they are very pleased, and the grandparents are Sarah and Wayne Smith, are the happy grandparents, so our, our joy is with the Smith family. And then for one more week, we have our prayer table out in the narthex, and we've been asking you to write a prayer on the slip of cloth that we have, a a slip of cloth with some uh, markers out there. And so if you could write a prayer that you're holding during this Lenten season or as we move through this Holy Week, and then all of those slips of cloth are going to be weaved together into a table pyramid. Uh, The flowers that are in the narthex are from uh, Phil Wilms' memorial service that we had here in the sanctuary yesterday. So our continued prayers for Phil's family during this time of loss. Well, now I do invite us to come together in a time of silent prayer so you can connect in your own way to God, and then I'll also offer us words of prayer. So let us be in a time of silent prayer. Holy God, we join today in the praise and shouts of Hosanna for the entry of Christ into our lives. Yet we know that we too find ourselves alternating between cheering and shouts of crucifying when the harsher realities of life tempt us to doubt your goodness. Nudge us, God, to follow you this day and in this week as we make our way toward the cross. Hold us close in this holy week as we sense our own shadows and questions, feel our own doubts and betrayals, and know our own fears of suffering and pain. Hold us close, O God, so that we may find your grace stronger than our fear, and so we may look into our hearts and find your hope. Loving God, open our eyes to the needs of those around us that are crying out for relief from the burdens and sufferings of life, from illness, violence, and war, and from tragedy and grief. We entrust all our prayers to you, God. Guide our ministry together, together as a faith community. Help us to determine wisely the possibilities and the opportunities we have to form ministry within and beyond the doors of our church. Boldly direct our vision and our work as you strengthen us for faithful service. We pray in the name of Jesus the Christ, who humbled himself in service to you and to others. Amen. Time of considering our offerings that we give to the church, we know that we give out of the blessings of our lives, out of the abundance of our lives, knowing that our giving truly is an act of worship. And our gifts work through the ministries of this church to help support the church and beyond the doors of our church so that we can share God's love with those in our community and literally around our world. And you may make your offering today. We'll have our offering plates at the door. Or you can give electronically. You can use the QR code that's on the card in the pew pocket or go to our church website to give electronically. Or you can continue to mail or bring your offering to the church. For those that are joining us online, you can give electronically or again mail or bring your offering to the church. 
And then each week we show you pictures to share a little bit about our story and to celebrate what our offerings are going to support. And today we have a short video that was made by our youth as they, are, that they were working with our theme of Come to the Table, and they are designing a table. So I invite you to watch this short video. We all start on the outside The outside looking in This is where grace begins We were hungry, we were thirsty With nothing left to give Oh, the shape that we were in Just when all hope seemed lost Love opened the door for us. He said, come to the table. Come join the sinners who have been redeemed. Take your place beside the Savior. Sit down and be set free. Come to the table. Liars and these thieves, there's no one unwelcome here. So that sin and shame that you brought with you, you can leave it at the door. Thank you for how our offerings support our youth ministries in this church. And now, in that gratitude, I invite you to stand as we sing the doxology. as we stand on the threshold of this holy week, as we lead ourselves to the cross with Jesus, we humble ourselves. We humble ourselves and make our confessions together as a faith community. So with humble hearts, I invite us to join together in our prayer of confession that is printed in your bulletin and also on the screen. Let us pray together. Holy God, we confess there are times when we lift up our voices and praise you, and then turn around. We lift our arms straight to all our and then lift our voices to hurt one another. When our cry out in despair, we are often too overwhelmed to respond to their pain. When others need to know what we love, we forget that all we need to do is to set a hand or walk beside them on their journey. Forgive us, O oh God, and help us to live our praise. We open ourselves to you as we only offer our side of confessions. Hear the good news. Right while we were sinning, God in Christ came offering us forgiveness and new life. It is in that spirit and that promise of forgiveness and new life and God's grace that I proclaim to you that we are a forgiven people. Thanks be to God. Amen. Amen.
this morning on this Palm Sunday, we have the joy and the blessing of welcoming new members into our congregation. And so I'd invite Deb Mulhern to join me. Deb is our director of Connecting Ministries. And Deb and I meet with our folks that are new to our congregation in our newcomers class. And then Deb meets with them individually to try to connect them into the life of the church. And then people that are making the formal decision to join the church come before us in worship. Deb will introduce our new members. So we'd like to invite the people joining the church and their sponsors to come forward. So I'd like to introduce you here to Ruth Hallblade. Ruth lives in Sun Prairie and is a retired Sun Prairie teacher. She enjoys sewing, knitting, and reading, and is already involved in our Wednesday noon Lenten study. And her sponsors are Tom and Paula Gray. And then I'd like to introduce you to Rusty and Heather Young. And they live in Madison and are both retired. Heather is already participating in the mental health team and the reconciling team. And Rusty is in the Saturday morning men's group. And they are both involved in prison ministry. And their sponsors are Mike and Harriet McGaffin. And then I'd like to introduce you to Emily Lord. And Emily lives about a block away and discovered our church while she was running with her eight month old Yay. puppy, Hazel. <laughs> She enjoys theater, running, baking, and chasing Hazel. <laughs> and her sponsor is Sarah Prother. So I ask you the vows that we ask all persons that join the United Methodist Church and ask you to respond to these. First, our membership into the church is an extension of our baptismal vows. So I ask you, do you renew the vows of your baptism that you made or were made on your behalf? If so, say, I do. And as members of Christ's universal church, Will you be loyal to the United Methodist Church and do all in your power to strengthen its ministries? If so, say, I will. And as members of this congregation, will you faithfully participate in its ministries by your prayers, your presence, your gifts, your service, and your witness? If so, say, I will. And as our congregation, we have a response for our new members, and I invite you to join in responsibly. Members of the household of God, I commend these persons to your love and care. Do all in your power to increase their faith, confirm their hope, and perfect them in love. We give thanks for all that God has already given you, and we welcome you in Christian love as members together with you as the body of Christ and in this congregation of the United Methodist Church. We renew our covenant faithfully to participate in the ministries of the church by our prayers, our presence, our gifts, our service, and our witness, that in everything God may be glorified through Jesus Christ. The God of all grace, who has called us to eternal glory in Christ, establish you and strengthen you by the power of the Holy Spirit, that you may live in grace and peace. Amen. Let us welcome our new members. Thank you, Sarah. Welcome, Rusty. Welcome, Heather. Thank you. Welcome, Ruth. Give them a head start on their way out here, and then afterwards, we'd like you to stop out in the narthex and introduce yourselves and welcome them. And before we close our worship this morning, I have some ways, opportunities that you can get connected and some invitations for you. First of all, I invite you to come to fellowship time right after our service today over in Fellowship Hall. And if you are a guest with us today or if you have just never tried fellowship time before, I invite you to come over for some coffee and donuts. And there's some cake over there too today. And we also have a guest table. Just as you walk into the Fellowship Hall, there's a guest table if you are new. And there's some members of our church that will be there and can greet you and answer questions about the church for you. And then if you do not already receive our Monday morning devotional word of the week or our Thursday email that outlines the ministries that are happening in our church, please contact the church office. We'll make sure we get you on those lists. 
And then the annual garage sale is fast approaching, the first weekend of May. And it takes a lot of people to make the garage sale happen. For those of you who have been around long enough, you probably have worked at the garage sale. And so today, at the, uh, between the services, uh, at between 9 and 9.30 and 10, and then again from 10 to 10.30, if you have questions about the garage sale or want to find ways that you can get connected, come to the library, which is just across the fellowship hall, and there'll be people from the garage sale committee to be able to answer questions and, and get you connected if you'd like to. And then today does mark the beginning of Holy Week with Palm Sunday, and then we'll move through this Holy Week and have worship together on Thursday. This will be our Holy Week worship, and we'll be combining our, what is typically our Monday, Thursday, and our Good Friday Tenebrae service together. Uh, it promises to be a very powerful service of worship. We are going to have a live reenactment of the Last Supper, and then we'll share communion together, and then we'll move into a Tenebrae portion of the service where we'll be extinguishing lights until we are sitting in silence and darkness. So we hope that you can join us on Thursday at 7 o'clock, and that we'll be here in the sanctuary and also online. And then Friday, on Good Friday, we will have the sanctuary open for a time of prayer and reflection between noon and three. And there'll be some quiet music playing. There'll be an opportunity to light candles. There'll be some guided prayers and scriptures, if you'd like, or just a, a time to sit in the quiet of the sanctuary and reflect on those hours that Jesus suffered. So I invite you to come on Good Friday as well. And then this coming Saturday is the Great Egg Hunt here for our community, and we're going to be having that this year over at Northside School at the playground, since Wetmore Park is under construction this year. 9 o'clock sharp, 9.01, eggs are gone. Okay, so 9, <laughs> nine o'clock sharp, come a little early, get ready for the hunt. There are 9,000 eggs that are going to be hidden, and that is a real number. They have been stuffing those eggs for months. So 9 o'clock for our children, and that, it's open to the community, so invite your neighbors and, and other children that you might know. And then join us next Sunday. It will be Easter, and our confirmation class will be sharing in the sunrise service at 7 o'clock. And so if you want to come to that, we'll be starting outdoors. We'll come indoors, and our confirmation class will lead us through worship. And then after our sunrise service, we'll have an opportunity for Easter breakfast, and that will run from 7.30 to 10.30. And then again, we'll worship at 8.30 and 10.45, both in person and online, and hope that you can join us on Easter Sunday and invite someone to be with you on Easter. Well, now I do invite you to stand for our closing blessing. Now, as we leave worship, may we hear again this week the stories of Jesus' life and death so that we can experience the power of new life. As we move through this holy week, may we know that the love of our Creator God, the redeeming grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, and the sustaining strength of the Holy Spirit is with us to lead us and to guide us. And may we always have the courage to live as God's grateful people. Amen.